the Harvard Law Review and the Columbia Law Review, you were flooded with job offers from the major <laughs> law firms. <laughs> had uh, three strikes against me. And after 13 years, did you think you had a chance to be on the Supreme Court? No one thinks uh, my aim in life is to be a Supreme Court justice. When you first got on the court, were there other justices saying, we're happy to see you here, let's go have dinner together? Justice O'Connor was the most welcoming. He gave me some very good advice. Would you fix your tie, please? Well, people wouldn't recognize me if my tie was fixed, but okay. <laughs> Just leave it this way. All right. I don't consider myself a journalist. And nobody else would consider myself a journalist. I began to take on the life of being an interviewer, even though I have a day job of running a private equity firm. How do you define leadership? What is it that makes somebody tick? When you went to Cornell, your grades were obviously very good. You applied to law school at Harvard. You got into Harvard Law School. Uh, was the class half women and half men? Or <laughs> at time? In those ancient days, I went to law school from 56 to 59. In my entering class at Harvard Law School, there were over 500 in the class. Nine of us were women. A big jump from Marty's class, he was a year ahead of me. There were five women in his class. And today, the Harvard Law School has about 50% women. Now, in your Harvard Law School class, you did extremely well, and you got onto the Harvard Law Review. And uh, you were near the top of your class, maybe first or tied for first in your class. But then when your husband uh, needed to move to New York, um, you wanted to transfer to Columbia Law School. And the dean of the Harvard Law School didn't think that was such a great idea if you wanted to be a Harvard graduate. Is that correct? Yes. <laughs> he said I had to spend my third year at Harvard. The reason I didn't was Marty was diagnosed with um, a t testicular tumor in his third year of law school. Those were early days for cancer cure. There was no such thing as chemotherapy. There was only massive radiation. We didn't know whether he would survive. And I didn't want to be a single mom, because Jane, my daughter, was 14 months when I started law school. So we wanted to stay together as a family. Marty had a good job with a firm in New York. And so I asked the dean, I thought it would be an easy answer. If I successfully complete my legal education at Columbia, may I have a Harvard degree? Absolutely not. You must spend the third year here. I had the perfect rebuttal because there was a Cornell classmate of mine who had had her first year of law school at Penn. She transferred into our second year class. And I said to the dean, well, Mrs. Isselbacher will be, will have her second and third year and will earn a Harvard degree. But it's, I think, universally understood that the first year of law school is by far the most important. She has year two and three. I have year one and two. It should make no difference. But I was told a rule is a rule, and that was So you that. went to Columbia Law School, and your law degree is from Columbia, is yes. that, right? OK. And you did extremely well at Columbia Law School yes. on the review there as well? Yes. So on the Harvard Law Review and the Columbia Law Review, you were flooded with job offers from the major <laughs> law firms. <laughs> there wasn't a single firm in the entire city of New York that would take a chance on me. And I have said that I had three strikes against me. One, I was Jewish. And the Wall Street firms were just beginning to welcome Jews. Then I was a woman. 
but the absolute killer, I was a mother because my daughter was four years old when I graduated from law school. So employers who might take a chance on a woman were not prepared to take a chance on a mother. So one of your law professors, Professor Gunther, got you, um, after many uh, efforts, to, uh, clerkship with Judge Palmieri. Yes. Was that easy to do for him because you were a mother? Yes, he had no qualms about a woman. He had had a, a woman as a law clerk before, but he was concerned. The Southern District of New York is a busy court, and sometimes he would need a law clerk's aid even on a Sunday. So Professor Gunther, I found out about this years later, I didn't know at the time, said to Judge Palmieri, give her a chance, and if she doesn't work out, there's a young man in her class who's going to a downtown firm. He will jump in and take over. And that was the carrot. There was also a stick, and the stick was, if you don't give her a chance, I will never recommend another Columbia student to you. Oh. That's, how, that's how it was for women of my vintage. Was getting the first job was powerfully hard. So after your clerkship, you ultimately got a position as a law professor at Rutgers? Yes, with an interlude when I was working for the Columbia Project on International Procedure. And how did you get connected to the ACLU and, and the, your, your trailblazing uh, efforts in gender discrimination and gender law? It came about first from my students at Rutgers who wanted a course on women in the law. So I repaired to the library, and inside of a month, I had read every federal decision ever written about gender-based distinctions in the law. It was no mean feat. There was precious little. And at the same time, new complaints were coming into the New Jersey affiliate of the ACLU, complaints of the kind the ACLU had not seen before. One group of complainants were public school teachers who were put on so-called maternity leave when their pregnancy began to show because the school district worried. We don't want the little children to think their teacher swallowed a watermelon. <laughs> These women were the leave was unpaid, and there was no guaranteed right to return. They began to complain. So it was the two things coming together, the students wanting to learn about a women's status under the law, and these new complainants coming to the ACLU. And for me, it was such a tremendous stroke of good fortune because up until the start of the 70s, it simply wasn't possible to move courts in the direction of recognizing women as people of equal citizenship stature. When President Clinton became president, um, you were obviously somebody being considered, and President Clinton said, well, women don't want her. I had uh, written a comment on Roe v. Wade, and it was not 100% applauding that decision. You, you won a number of cases for the ACLU on gender discrimination and became quite well known. You later taught at Columbia, but um, you were asked to go on to the uh, U.S. Court of Appeals of the District of Columbia uh, by President Carter. Were you surprised to get that appointment? Did, did you want to be a judge, or were you happy to be a professor? <laughs> President Carter deserves enormous credit 
for what the federal bench looks like today. When he became president, he noticed that the federal judges all looked like him. That is, they were all white and they were all male. And Carter appreciated that that's not how the great United States looks. So he was determined to put women and members of minority groups on the federal courts in numbers, not as one at a time curiosities. I think he appointed over 25 women to district court judgeships and 11, 11 women to courts of appeals. And I was, I think, the last of the lucky 11. So you served 13 years on the Court of Appeals in the District of Columbia. Yes. And after 13 years, did you think you had a chance to be on the Supreme Court, or do you think this was something that might never happen? No one thinks uh, my aim in life is to be a Supreme Court justice. It just isn't realistic. There are only nine of us. And luck has a lot to do with who are the particular nine at a particular time. So growing up, I never had an idea of being any kind of a judge. Because as I said, women were barely there on the bench. When, when Carter became president, there was only one woman on a federal court of appeals. She was Shirley Hofstetler on the Ninth Circuit. He made her the first ever Secretary of Education. And then there were none again. Carter changed that, and no president ever went back to the way it was. Reagan didn't want to be outdone by Carter, so he was determined to put the first woman on the US Supreme Court. He made a nationwide search and came up with a spectacular choice in Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. When President Clinton became president, um, you were obviously somebody being considered and then President Clinton talked to somebody who was pushing for your appointment, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, and President Clinton said, well, women don't want her. Now, how could that have been the case when you were the leading lawyer in gender discrimination? Why would women have not wanted you, or some women not wanted you on the Supreme Court? Just some women, uh, most women uh, were over, overwhelmingly, supportive, overwhelmingly supportive of my nomination. But I had uh, written a comment on Roe v. Wade, and it was not 100% um, applauding that decision. What I said was the court had an easy target because the Texas law was the most extreme in the nation. Abortion could be had only if necessary to save the woman's life. Doesn't matter that her health would be ruined, that she was the victim of rape or incest. I thought Roe v. Wade was an easy case, and the Supreme Court could have held that most extreme law unconstitutional and put down its pen. Instead, the court wrote an opinion that made every abortion restriction in the country, illegal, in one fell swoop. And that was not the way that the court ordinarily operates. You know, it waits, it, it waits till the next case and the next case. Anyway, it was that, that, that some women felt that I should have been 100% in favor of Roe v. Wade, and it, because I wasn't. Right. So President uh, Clinton met with you, and obviously you had a good meeting, and he offered you the uh, appointment, and the confirmation went pretty well, would you say? 96 to 3, yes, I'd say that was. <laughs> so you've um, now been on the court for 26 years, and therefore total, you've been on the uh, federal judiciary for 39 years. So in 26 years on the Supreme Court, when you first got on the court, were there other justices saying, we're happy to see you here, let's go have dinner together, let's socialize, or 
where they just kind of standoffish mm -hmm. a bit. And what was your relationship with uh, Sandra Day O'Connor like when you got on the court as the second woman on the court? The, the court wasn't an unknown territory to me. I mean, I worked at the Court of Appeals just a f few blocks down the road. Um, and every once in a while, Judge David Bassalon, who was quite senior, would, would call me and, and say, Ruth, we're going to Kronheim's for lunch. Who was Kronheim? He was the biggest liquor distributor in the D.C. area. And before we went to his warehouse, we would stop at the Supreme Court and pick up Justice Brennan and Justice Marshall. Um, I knew Justice Scalia from our Court of Appeals days together. I knew Justice Clarence Thomas, who was also on the DC circuit. But Sandra was as close as I came to having a big sister. You know, I did have a big sister, but she died in my infancy, so I never knew her. Justice O'Connor was the most welcoming, gave me some very good advice, not only when I was a new justice, but during my first cancer bout, because Justice O'Connor had breast cancer, and she was on the bench nine days after her cancer surgery. Well. So she was very clear about what I had to do. She said, Ruth, you have your chemotherapy on a Friday. That way you'll get over it during the weekend. You can be back. Right. Oh. Now, the best way to uh, win a case if you're arguing one before the Supreme Court is it to write a great brief, to write a, uh, to be a great oral advocate. Does the oral argument really make a difference or the brief really make a difference or what's the best way to win a case in the Supreme Court for somebody who might want to argue a case? <laughs> to have a case that's strong on the merits. No, an oral argument at the court is not a debate. Um, I'd say of the two components of appellate advocacy, the brief is by far the most important. It's what we start with and what we end up with when we go back to chambers. Oral argument is fleeting. If somebody wants to be a Supreme Court clerk, do you just send in a letter applying or how does that work? We get hundreds and hundreds of applications. meets from October to June, more or less. So what do the justices do in July and August? Do they sit around reading briefs or they do other things? One business that follows us all over the world throughout the year is the death penalty business, which the court treats like a firing squad. Very often, when an execution date is set, there's an 11th hour application for a stay. Right. No one justice is responsible for the final vote. We all are polled wherever we are in the world. But in addition, most of us take some time off to teach. So uh, today, uh, when you are um, thinking about the court, what is it that gives you the greatest hope for the future about the court and the way it works? I think that all of us revere the institution for which we work and we want to leave it in as good shape right. as we found it. And if somebody wants to be a Supreme Court clerk, each justice gets, I think, four clerks. Uh, you just send in a letter applying or how does that work? <laughs> We get hundreds and hundreds of applications. My best source for law clerks are other judges, other federal judges. Law professors tend to write glowing letters of recommendation. Everyone is the best and the brightest student that ever graduated from this law school. 
But my colleagues on other federal courts will tell me the straight story. So very often I'll get a call from another federal judge saying, I have a clerk this year who I think would be just right for you. So those are my best recommenders. So um, we have a few questions from people who are attending today. If you could change one thing about the Constitution, what would it be and why? <laughs> so I guess you probably, um, if you were a founding father or founding mother, um, what might you have put into the Constitution that didn't quite get in there? I would add an equal rights amendment to the Thank Constitution. You. And I explain it this way. When I take out my pocket Constitution to show my granddaughters, I can show them the First Amendment that guarantees freedom of speech and of the press, but I can't point to anything that says women and men are persons of equal citizenship stature. Every constitution in the world written since the year 1950 has the equivalent of that statement. Men and women are persons equal in stature before the law. So I would like my now great grandchild to have a constitution okay. that includes that statement that this is a fundamental premise of our society just the way freedom of thought and expression. What gives you the most hope for the future? My granddaughters. Okay. I'm very proud of my eldest granddaughter, who is a lawyer, cares a great deal about our country, and about its highest values, she and other young people like her, I think, will help us get back on track. Okay. And um, what do you think is the biggest threat to our democracy? <laughs> a, a public that doesn't care about preserving the rights we have. You know that great speech on liberty by Judge Learned Hand? And he says, if the fire, he said, if the fire dies in the hearts of people, there's no constitution and no judge that can re restore it. So my, my faith is in the spirit of liberty. So um, when you go to a restaurant these days, can you actually have dinner without a uh, selfie request or people coming up for autographs? Is it possible for you to do that anymore? <laughs> it's amazing. I am 86 and a half years old, and everyone wants to take a picture with me. <laughs> Justice Ginsburg, I want to thank you very much for a very interesting conversation. Thank you for thank you for your uh, your, your service to our country over 39 years.